أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل الله على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين الذين قال عنهم الرسول اللهم إن هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاصتي وحامتي لحمهم لحمي ودمهم دمي يؤلمني ما يؤلمهم ويحزنني ما يحزنهم أنا حرب لمن حاربهم وسلم لمن سالمهم وعدو لمن عاداهم ومحب لمن أحبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فجعل صلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورضوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربى سلوة على محمد وآل محمد It is indeed uh, a, a pleasure for me to be here amongst all of you and um, uh, although I am not too well today but uh, I had promised Meghdad that I will be here and I had to make an effort so this may impact on the way I speak and also on um, my performance but inshallah I hope your understanding will be greater than my illness inshallah ta'ala um, tonight actually is a uh, is also the the wafat of uh, our 10th Imam my grandfather in fact Imam Ali al-Naqi alayhi salatu was salam Muhammad al-Wali and uh, and uh, we will of course he will be remembered and uh, tributes will be paid to him and uh, his teachings will be taken uh, inshallah next week but uh, i have been asked to speak about imam muhammad al baqir alayhi salatu was salam our fifth imam uh, who is the 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 imam after imam zain al abidin alayhi salatu was salam they are very unique uh, situations of this fifth Imam uh, that we have of the Ahlul Bayt but before I go into the the life and the personality of Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam just a reminder for myself and all of us of course here is that it is a month of Rajab as well and uh, the month of Rajab as they say uh, it's called Rajab al-Murajab where uh, the du'as are accepted as the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam has also said uh, shahru rajab shahru, uh, shahru istighfar the month of rajab is the month of istighfar the month of rajab is the month of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to uh, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now what I would uh, look at it is is this way that it is a factory reset button, if you like, the month of Rajab, because it is from amongst the sacred months that is mentioned in the Holy Quran as well. Because as you all know that there are four sacred months in the Holy Quran in which Allah has also uh, uh, not permitted really a, a battle, even fighting. You know, forget armies. I mean, we, we at, the, at, at the present time, we fight at home, we fight between husbands and wives. So month of Rajab is something that this thing should not happen. And then there is Zil Hajj, of course, there is Zil Qa'ad, there is Zil Hajj, and then there is Muharram. But Rajab is a stand-alone month, and it is called Shahrul Fard as well, in which it is said that the, 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 the du'as are accepted. Now, one thing is, is just as a reminder for myself and all of you is, that although we are told that this is the month of uh, the month of du'a and the month of istighfar, it is sometimes uh, a necessary for a person to reflect on what it means when it is said that it is the month of du'a, really. Because sometimes I find, and, uh, and I hope I'm wrong, because I don't want to be judgmental across, but sometimes I find that we do certain rituals, certain du'as, which really we don't know why we're doing. 
So for example, I asked someone, what does Laylatul Raghaib mean for you? And he said, oh, I'm going to go to Laylatul Raghaib. It's one of the best a'mals that you could do in the month of Rajab. And it is in the first of the Thursday of the month of Rajab between the Maghrib and the Isha Namaz. But when I asked the person what it meant for, for him to do Laylatul Raghaib, he couldn't speak much. And that gave me an inclination that I even sometimes used to. And, you know, sometimes when I just sit and do some rituals, I don't understand why I'm doing them. So when we are told that this is the month of dua, and when we sit to recite dua, or when we sit to do astaghfar, how do we do astaghfar? The first question that I need to ask myself, how would I do dua, really? Would I just open any book and recite the way I just recite any dua? For example, if you look at any dua, do I mashlul, let's take if an example, or do I kumel that we normally recite on a Thursday? We find that it's, of course, a wonderful dua. But both of these duas were given to individuals during that time. It is not my dua. For example, dua i kumel is a dua given to kumel ibn Ziyad by Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu salam. Imam Ali gave it to Kumail to say, this is a dua for you. Therefore, the dua that Kumail recited came from his heart. It became his dua. It would only become my dua if I meant what I read. If I meant what I said. Then yes, I can transform it and make it into my dua. Similarly, dua i mashlul. When someone gets ill, when someone gets fever, when someone gets paralyzed... And when, you know, you ask, what can I do? Say, recite Dua Mashlul. It was given to this person who was paralyzed. But it was for that person. It can only be my Dua when I mean it. And that is one thing that I feel it's very important. Because Rajab, then comes Sha'ban, and then Ramadan. This is as one of the hadiths of the, of the Imam Ali, alayhi salatu wasalam, in which he says, Shahru Rajab is my Rajab. The month of Rajab is my uh, month. Shahr Sha'ban is the month of the Prophet and the household of the Holy Prophet. In Rajab, akthiru al-istighfar. Do astaghfar as much as you can. In the month of Sha'ban, recite salawat on Muhammad and Ali Muhammad as much as you can. And then comes the month of Ramadan, whereby the maxim, one, one has to maximize the glorification and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in order for me to do that to the right essence of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the dua that I would do to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that I would understand at least the duas that I perform, the istighfar that I do. Why am I doing the istighfar? Sometimes I sin. And it is a fact that people sin because they are not infallible. However, one takes the sin as is to be is such a huge sin that, you know, Allah would never forgive me. Whereas in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is there that Allah is so merciful that no sin, actually, no sin could be as great as the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the greater your sin, or the greater my sin, the greater the mercy of Allah is. And that is why it would be very important for me at least, that when I do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these months of Rajab, Sha'ban, and Ramadan, I actually understand what I'm saying, even if it is for a line that I'm reciting. I don't need to recite 10 pages of dua. And if I don't recite 10 pages of dua, that doesn't mean that my Rajab is is not murajjab anymore. But if I do read the holy uh, the du'as, if I do astaghfar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to astaghfar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I have to mean exactly what I'm saying. Otherwise, really, it would remain a ritual. And this ritual would just be uh, as we normally you know, recite. Recite aloud, salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Again, you know, there are many things that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, we can speak about the, the uh, benefits or not only the benefits of the month of Rajab, but even the, the sanctity of the month of Rajab. Fasting, for example, 
is highly, highly, highly recommended in the month of Rajab. Now, one may say that, you know, the month of Rajab is just a month, really. There's nothing in there. But if you look at the events that happened in the month of Rajab, several. On the 27th of Rajab, for example, there is Bi'that, Mi'raj of the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. On the 13th of Rajab is the actual uh, wiladat of Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is the identity of the Shiite Ummah. It is the, you know, it is the birth of the, the, the holy Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. There are so many other things that have happened in the month of Rajab. And if you look at the month of Rajab, I feel and I think that it is the only month, apart from, of course, Muharram and Safar and Ramadan, whereby the congregation or the people will gather the most in the centers around the world. To remember, to commemorate the wafats, to remember and do the khushalis of the A'imma salamullahi alayhi wa jma'in. But at the same time, to remember and to remember the, uh, the, the, the month that it is a month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where he has given us the opportunity of whatever we have downloaded in ourselves, to have a reset or a push button that we have in our bodies, for example, that in the month of Rajab, it would become reset to factory settings again until Ramadan and then after Ramadan, downloads start happening again. And then when comes the month of Rajab, if Allah gives us the opportunity of living further, then of course we can always do astaghfar as much as we can. Now, in this month, and of course the first of uh, Rajab is the birth of uh, our, our holy Imam, Imam Muhammad Baqir alayhi salatu wassalam. One or two unique things about this Imam is that he is called, or he one of uh, one of his names was Al Alawiyu Bain Al Alawiyin, because he his father is Imam Zain Al Abidin Salam. His grandfather, paternal grandfather, is Imam Hussein Salam. So Imam Muhammad bin Ali bin Hussein bin Ali bin Abi Talib You see. And if you look at his mother, Imam Muhammad Baqir's mother, her name is Fatima, Fatima bint al-Hasan, Ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. So Fatima, the daughter of Imam Hassan alayhi salatu wassalam, who is the son of Imam Ali alayhi salatu wassalam. So if you look at the paternal and the maternal grandparents of the Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu wassalam, you will find that one is Imam Hussein and one is Imam Hassan alayhi salatu wassalam. Now, this is unique as far as any other imam is concerned. From 1st to 12, this imam has a unique lineage. And that is why he's a Fatimi, he's a Hashimi, he's an Alawi, Bain al Alawiyin. And he is the imam that was given the opportunity of spreading knowledge. Because if you look at the history, you will find that after the Holy Prophet, Imam Ali, والسلام, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, were surviving really. There was a battle of survival during those times. Imam Ali was busy in battles, Safin, Khawarij, Muawiyah, all these things. He was busy with, with you know, other, so many other things. Not that he did not spread any knowledge. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is he was, his time was too much consumed in, all, in, in these things as well. If you look at Imam Hassan, you will see that Imam Hassan also had a lot of battles in his hands with Muawiyah, for example. He had to have a peace treaty signed and things like that. People left him, they abandoned him, his own <coughs> companions and all. And the peak of Dhulm, of course, came in Karbala when Imam Hussein والسلام, was brutally massacred, as we all know. Then Imam Zainul Abidin, of course, was given the opportunity of, of, you know, uh, of being lonely for a while. And he was a quiet imam, like not that he didn't do anything. There was Sayyifai Sajjadiyya, that is of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salatu salam. But the peak of knowledge, uh, uh, what do you call, um, spreading of knowledge came during the time of Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salatu salam and his son Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salatu salam. And that is because the uh, Khulafa during those times were busy were really busy in fortifying their own um, uh, khilafat, if you like. And they were busy in 
lavish lifestyles and all this. So Imam was given the opportunity of spreading the knowledge. One of the things that is important for, for, for us to know about this Imam al-Baqir is that it is the Holy Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who gave the title of al-Baqir to this Imam. So he had, a, uh, and this is a famous, famous narration in the books of history, that there was a time when Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, who again, a companion of the Holy Prophet, a very close companion of the Holy Prophet, so close that you know what? This hadith al-Kisa is reported by him. So when we recite hadith al-Kisa, of course we start with An Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, An Fatima al-Zahra. He was so close to the holy Ahlul Bayt. He, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari was once seated with the holy prophet and the prophet said, Jabir, listen, you will live for a long time. And when you live for a very long time, there will come a time in my grandchild, children, there will uh, come a, 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 a son will be born to my grandchild. It will be my grandchild whose name will be my name. And he will be called Al-Baqir. When you hear someone called Al-Baqir, sit him down and give him my salams. Give my salams to him, basically. The Holy Prophet wasallam had prophesied about Al-Baqir and told Jabir, one of his companions, that when you meet him, you go and give my salams to him. It is narrated that Jabir, during the time, during the end of his life, he had started to become blind. So he used to sit in Medina, outside the mosque and here and there, and always used to ask people, have you seen Al-Baqir? Has anybody know Al-Baqir? Is Al-Baqir around here somewhere? Is, where is Al-Baqir? Where is Al-Baqir? And people used to make fun of him. They used to say, you know, this guy is, is become someone that is, has got no sense anymore. But one day, Imam Zain al-Abidin was walking Imam Muhammad al-Baqir towards the uh, Masjid al-Nabi. And as he was going, it is said that Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari shouted out, Ya Abu Baqir, is there Baqir coming? And as Imam Muhammad al-Baqir was going towards uh, uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, Imam Zain al-Abidin said, Oh Jabir, who are you looking for? And he said, Ya Imam, I am sensing the footsteps of the Holy Prophet. Such was the sense of Imam Muhammad al-Baqir when he walked towards Jabir. That he said, I can sense the footsteps of the Holy Prophet. And is al-Baqir around? And Imam said, yes, this is my son Muhammad al-Baqir. And Jabir set him down on the lap and kissed his feet and his hands. And he said that, uh, you know, your grandfather had asked me to convey his salams to you. And this is something really unique. Because the Holy Prophet وسلم, had sent the salams, special salutations, if you like, to Imam Muhammad al-Baqir through his companion Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So you can see that here, this Imam of ours, uh, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, one of his, his statements that I uh, really, uh, I have uh, actually found out to be very relevant to our time, if you like, is that he once said uh, uh, to his companion, he said, Oh Jabir, it is not enough, it is not enough that a person says, I am a Shia and I love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi It is not enough. And it is not enough for him to also say that not only that I love the Holy Prophet, but I love the Prophet's family and the Imams. He says, by Allah, Imam says, a Shia is the one who is perfectly pious and obedient to Allah's commands. Now, this is important. Anyone else is not a Shia, no matter how much they say they love Imam Ali والسلام, or the other Aimma. Why? And no matter what they call themselves, O oh Jabir, and look at this ethics, the peak of ethics, if you like. O oh Jabir, our Shias are known by these signs. They are truthful, trustworthy, worthy, and loyal. These values, truthfulness, trustworthiness, loyalty, are 
not values of, of, of Islam. They are human values. They are values that are important to every human being on the face of this earth. He then goes to say, they always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why not? So be, see, because if I don't remember Allah, I will, what will I do? If there is no accountability for me on the day of judgment, what will I do? They offer their prayers, O Jabir, Imam says. Observe fasts and recite the Holy Quran. Now again, when we come to the recitation of the Holy Quran, I remember one of the quotes of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam in Nahjul Balagha, in which he said, Sayati ala nasi zamanun. There will come a time on people. I don't know when, which this time is going to be, but he prophesied, Imam Ali predicted this. Sayati ala nasi zamanun la yabqa fihim min al Qurani illa rasmu. That nothing of the Quran will remain except the rasm of the Holy Quran. The recitation of the Holy Quran. The style of reciting the Holy Quran. You know, competitions of the Holy Quran. But the substance will not be taken. Imam Ali said. Sayati ala nasi zamanun la yabqa fihim min al Qurani illa rasmu. Wala min al Islami illa ismu. And Islam will remain, yes, but by name. People will be Muslims, they will be called Muslims, but it will be by name. You know, sometimes when I go to places like America, for example, it's recording, I can see that, but you know, the, I, three, four hours at the immigration is a must for me. Just because maybe my name is Ali, I don't know. But the same questions, and for years and years and years, they ask me the same question. I have a, I have a Muslim name, yes, but I am not a terrorist. <laughs> See, so anyway, nothing of Islam will remain except the name of Islam. And then Imam said something very, very important. He said, "Yoma idin masajiduhum amiratum min al bina, kharabum min al huda." During those times, he said, Imam Ali said, "You will find beautiful mosques around the world, fantastic centers around the world." But they will be empty from guidance. And this is such an important, important message given to Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. So Imam al-Baqir here is saying that they offer their prayers, who? The, the faithful, the Shias of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Observe fasts and recite the Holy Quran. And then he said, they help their neighbors. Look at these values. They are so relevant to the people who are living in the West, for example. They help their neighbors, take care of orphans, and say nothing but good of people. So riba, backbiting, all is, is, is absent, by the way. They act nicely towards their parents. They are worthy of people's trust and confidence. This is the teachings of Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, alayhi salatu wasalam. One another important thing, and then inshallah we will end here. One another important thing is that his name Al-Baqir has a very deep important meaning. And the meaning is Baqir means the one who splits or splitter of knowledge. Splitter of knowledge. So he let me just give you an example. I was talking about this to my son and he was amused. So I said, I, let me share it with you as well. During one of the, uh, the Khalifa of the time, Hisham, called Imam uh, uh, al-Baqir to his courtyard. He said, I want you to come bring him and his son to the courtyard. So Imam went, both of the Imams, <coughs> Imam al-Baqir took his son, Imam Ja'far Sadiq, they went to Hisham. In the courtyard, Hisham had organized archery. So there were master archers over there who were doing archery. And Hisham's, of course, intention was to insult the Imam. So Imam al-Baqir entered and after salutations and greetings and whatnot, he said, Oh, Imam, listen, you are known about, you know, of your knowledge and this and that. How about archery? So Imam, you know, just looked at him and said, I don't think this is appropriate for me at the moment. He says, no, 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 I insist you must do some archery. 
And Imam again, you know, ins- you know, said that, I mean, it's okay, I mean, it's all right. He said, no, I insist that you do archery. And he was command- one of the guys was commanded to give a bow and an arrow to the Imam, say, go give it to this man. And Imam, of course, took the bow and the arrow, and as he put the aim, it went straight on, of course, to bullseye. It was right in the middle. And people were, of course, wow, subhanallah, mashallah. He was given another arrow. That other arrow also Imam shot right in the middle of the arrow that it split the first arrow apart. Right in the middle. He did this nine times. Imam, alayhi salatu salam, nine times. And people, of course, were at awe at this Imam and said, wow, not only he knows geography, physics, biology, mathematics, geography, but he even knows archery. And not only archery, but this type of archery. That he's splitting arrows upon arrows as he's hitting right in the middle of the target. So another important message that I would like to take home with me of Imam al-Baqir is that his name al-Baqir means the one who split open knowledge. And that to me means that whenever I would look at any knowledge, I would not take knowledge at face value. I would dig deeper into it. Critical thinking, for example, at at times is needed. Recent days, of course, we see that some of us are, you know, we discourage others to go deep into knowledge sometimes. I mean, scholars, not all scholars are right and not all scholars are wrong. I mean, people make mistakes. During the time in India, for example, some, uh, some many years ago, the scholars of India had, had given a decree, a fatwa, that English, to learn English was, was not allowed to, for Muslims in India at, at, at that particular moment. And that caused such backwardness of, of information and of knowledge. And the teaching of Imam al-Baqir on one hand is that when you look at knowledge, whichever knowledge it may be, you don't look at it only at surface. You need to, we need to go deeper and deeper and deeper into knowledge. Let that mean that then sometimes critical questions stand up and ask to question on certain practices and certain laws that exist in Islamic law whereby people can start saying that oh, what does, this doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, then make sense of it. For example, the most famous, two or three most famous students of Imam al-Baqir والسلام, Aban ibn Taghlab, uh, Zurara bin A'yun, Kumait al-Asadi, who was a poet even. This Zurara bin A'yun, master hadith, muhaddith. Today, fiqh is quite predominantly dependent on Zurara bin A'yun because of the hadith. And in fact, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir والسلام, himself had said, that had it not been of Zurara, my hadiths or my grandfather's narrations and hadiths would not have reached the Ummah. Muhammad ibn Muslim, 25,000, I don't know, 16,000 hadiths alone of Muhammad ibn Muslim. Aban ibn Taghlab, fiqh is dependent on these people. Scholars of, of tafsir, of uh, hadith, and Kumait, a poet, a poet. And Imam loved poetry as well. These were the students that Imam al-Baqir had taken out. So, one of the most important messages, and you know what? Knowledge, gaining of knowledge for men, for women. Doesn't matter how it is, you know, it is taken, but it is equal for men and equal for women. There is no way that some, you know, other Muslims tell us that women are not allowed to go to school. You see, the Taliban, for example, they killed women when they, go to, they, they went to school. In fact, if they, when they failed to shoot them, they used to poison the girls who used to go to school. Whereas the world does not exist without women. It's not going to happen. It's impossible. And if women don't have the appropriate knowledge, then even men is not going to be supported fully. I mean, even if you look at the lives of the prophets from Adam, to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. 
you will find that every prophet's life has been influenced by a woman. Their story is incomplete without a story of a woman in their lives. Look at Adam, you'll have to speak about Hawa. Look at Yusuf, you'll have to speak about Zulekha. Look at Hajar, uh, Ibrahim, you'll have to speak about Hajara. Look at uh, Janab Isa, and you'll have to speak about Maryam. Look at the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And you'll have to speak about Fatima to Zahra and Khadija to Kubra. So which Islam would tell us that women are not, go, are, are not supposed to educate themselves or study and go as far as they want to go? So in Al-Baqir, in the, the teachings of Imam Muhammad Al-Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam, it is there for me that it is, it is fortunate really that we are the followers of the Ahlul Bayt whereby Imams like Imam al-Baqir not only encourages knowledge and gaining of education but then gives us the, the, um, the, the tool if you like or encouraging us to split open the knowledge that we are even seeking. And with this I will uh, ask for your leave inshallah ta'ala and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq of understanding Allah better and of course in understanding the, 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 the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may I once again wish all of you uh, a very blessed month of Rajab and we pray to Allah that he gives us the tawfiq to remember Allah and to do astaghfar uh, during this holy month of Rajab. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have a few minutes for question and answer. If there are any questions from either side, <coughs> start with this, this is lady side. If there are no questions, that will be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> no questions. Okay, I think we'll end there. Thank you. Asante <laughs> Zakallah. Thank you very much. Salawat. <laughs>